Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Good morning. Welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Y'all sounded fantastic this morning. I love your worship. I love the fact that you're here to hear the Word of God. If you're visiting with us, please understand that what we do is uh, we just teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Bible. We happen to be in Romans on Sunday mornings right now. We're in 2 Samuel on Wednesday nights having a discussion-based thing there. want to welcome everybody to those things. So if you're visiting with us, you come back next week. We'll be in the next chapter. Sometimes on Easter, we'll do something special, a topical thing. And uh, so in preparing for this week, I was trying to decide if I was supposed to do that. I was praying about it, and God gave me an idea. And I was like, okay, it's topical. I'm doing that. I'm stepping away from Romans. But it wasn't a full idea. And the more I tried to work on it and work on it and work on it, it just didn't fill up. And so I was like, well, I don't know, man. I'm just going to go read some Romans because that's where we're at. So I read chapter 4 of Romans. What do you know? Romans 4 is an Easter message. So the extra stuff that he gave me fit right into that. So we are pressing ahead with Romans chapter 4. We'll go back and get just a few verses in chapter 3 just to kind of set the tone for where we are today in case some of you missed the last teaching. So in Romans chapter 3, I'm reading out of the New King James this morning, verse 21. And perhaps I should turn to the correct book instead of talking so much. I turned to the wrong book. That does not help. Romans, Romans, chapter 3, <laughs> verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In chapter 3, we see the introduction of the key concept that is most important for every one of us to understand. Justification, that is labeled as just, righteous, and innocent, by grace, which is unmerited, unearned favor, through faith, which is an assurance, a belief, a trust, we'll talk more about that today, in Jesus Christ, specifically, the Messiah, the Son of God, our Savior, because He is the propitiation, that word's important, propitiation is the appeasement of the wrath of God that is poured out against sin and unrighteousness. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Absolutely. And the wages of sin is, is death? Certainly. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what we're here to celebrate today. Today we're going to move into chapter 4, which will explain in great depth this idea of faith. Pray with me. Lord, we come before you this morning asking for your presence to be felt here in the message, as it was in the worship, as it has been in the fellowship, as it has been all day here today. May you be glorified in our treatment of your holy word, your scriptures, your oracles, your truth. May the words be yours. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may I speak with all authority, but all tenderness, with all truth and, and solidity, but with meekness and in faith that you are just and the justifier. Speak to us today from the truth of your word that we would be more like you when we leave this place than we were when we arrived, that we would understand better the truth of you and your gospel more and more so that we can share it better and better. Have your way. It's in Jesus' name. God's people said. Amen. Moving into chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Paul is writing to a Jewish audience here. The Jews revered Abraham as the epitome of righteousness. They claimed their connection to God based on the fact that they were Abraham's bloodline, his offspring, and by their actions, which they tried to make align with his. That seems like a good thing, and it certainly can be. This imitation of him and his faith and his works probably started off pure of motives, 
But it missed the mark eventually, terribly, eventually. Because it led to a works-based righteousness where they thought if they were keeping the rules well enough, that is what connected them, honestly, to God. As we read in the last chapter, where is boasting then? It is excluded because it's not about works. It's about something completely different. We know that. Those of you who have been in the Word for a while, those of you who have been followers of Christ for a while, you know that there is no boasting, that it's not about your goodness or anything like that. I think we really honestly believe that we can impress God as a way of making Him love us enough to save us or to keep us connected to Him. But be honest, don't we still fall into the trap of boasting about our spiritual mountaintops and maybe our charitable contributions sometimes? And the flesh gets involved. And... Sometimes the focus turns to us and away from God. Sometimes we're talking about our deeply rewarding times of closeness with the Lord or or how He used us to help somebody else or our adherence to something that we learned maybe in the Sunday message. But we wind up talking about us more than Him, which is always dangerous. Have you ever done this? Have you ever known somebody who has done this? I guarantee you have. Sometimes it sounds like this. Yeah, in my quiet time the other day, you know, you know I get up about 5 a.m. every day so I can spend about an hour with the Lord. And, you know, that's a real blessing to me. And it really, I, I find that it just makes my whole day better. And then we go on to share the thing that he shared with us during our quiet time. But it really doesn't get as much time as our setup about how great we are for getting up at 5 a.m. or whatever time we're doing our quiet time. Sometimes it's, it's a charitable thing and, and it'll get disguised as a prayer request. Hey, pray for this young couple I met the other day. I ran into him. I, you know, I was, I was really asking God that I would, would have an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody that day. And, you know, he put somebody in my path and it was this young couple and they were struggling. I, I spent quite a bit of time with them and, and, you know, I prayed with them and, and we had a meal together actually. And I gave them, gave them a little cash to help them on their way. And please pray for them. Where's the focus? Was it on the needs of the young couple when we told the story, or was it on the great lengths that we took to be a blessing to the young couple? See how subtle it can be? The the temptation is there to turn the focus away from God. It all needs to be on Him, always, continually. Like we are very inconsequential in these stories. It needs to be by him, about him, for him. It's not even about the people that you're helping or, or even the truth that he gives you. It's about him and his willingness to be involved in such situations. In Psalm 32, verse 2, it says, My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. This is important for many different reasons. Here are two. First, it keeps things in the proper perspective for us because it's a constant reminder that he is the good in our life, not us. But also it helps others keep the proper, proper perspective too. If my testimony is more about my quiet time than what God did during my quiet time, then there's danger of the, the person hearing about it, feeling like there's something great about me. And what I'm doing, which has led to God's blessing, which, with the help of the flesh and the help of the enemy, it could make them feel like there's something lesser about them if they haven't experienced the same kind of thing. If we don't focus on the fact that he gave that nugget during our quiet time or that opportunity to help somebody else by grace through faith, they may not see that it's, that it's something that's ex- just as accessible to them as it is to us. When the focus is always on him, then it's always an encouragement. And when it's not, it can very easily be a discouragement. We have to be really careful with that. You can take the truth and something great that God did and make it a discouragement to somebody. How sad when that happens. Abraham did lots of things, lots of works that pointed to what his faith was in. When God told him to leave his home and set out on a journey, he went. If you haven't read that story, go read it. God says to him, leave all your family behind. Take you and your immediate family, and okay, your nephew can go, okay, and go to a place I will show you. What? Go to a place I will show you. 
Where is it, Lord? You'll see. How long is it going to take to get there? You'll find out. What am I going to do when I get there? You're going to love it. It's going to be awesome. Just go. Just go. And Abraham went. How many of you would do that? If you, even if you knew God was the one speaking, if he just said, hey, pack up all your stuff, put it in a U-Haul, put it in drive, and I'll tell you where to go. How many of you are doing that? That's what Abraham did. It's beautiful. What about when God told him to sacrifice his son, Isaac? And he set out to do it. Like that's an amazing work. A righteous work. Man, God told me to do the hardest thing ever. And I just trusted him and I did it. That's amazing. Again, if you don't know the story, go read the story. This is the son that he waited decades and decades and decades for. The one that finally arrived. After all this time. And then God says... Okay, now go sacrifice him on the altar. Abraham collected the stuff for the sacrifice and he told Isaac to come on and go. He just went. He did amazing works. But notice when God declared Abraham righteous, which is when God labeled him as just and innocent. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. It wasn't because he did anything. It's because he believed. And that's what meant something to God. And that's what the game changer was. This word believed, it's not just intellectual acceptance that something is true. It's placing the fullness of your trust in something that you believe is true. Now you may not grasp the difference between the two. Got a great illustration for that. Anybody familiar with a guy named Charles Blondin? You should watch the news more. In the mid-1800s, he was a daredevil that, that became famous for doing amazing things that nobody had ever even thought of trying to do. In 1859, he got permission to go to Niagara Falls, And he stretched a tightrope all the way across the falls, 160 feet up in the air above him, from the U.S. to Canada, all the way across. And he walked the tightrope over and back. It was amazing. It got a lot of attention, so he just kept doing it. And he's doing it every day. And then, you know, the the crowds are, are not as impressed as they were when he first started doing it, which is how it works. So he had to start doing tricks, you know. He went across on stilts one time. He carried his manager on his back one time when he went across it. He, he, he did a gymnastics routine across it one time where he's like doing tumbling and flips and cartwheels and he, hang, he hangs off of it for a while out in the middle. It's crazy stuff. The crowds are growing bigger and bigger and bigger on both sides, the U.S. and Canada. They can't get enough of this guy. But he has to keep upping it, right? He has to keep making it uh, cooler and cooler and cooler. So one of the reports that I read said that, that he had some kind of little stove that he took with him. And as he's walking across the tightrope, he made an omelet as he's going across. 160 feet up in the air. Crazy stuff. On July 15th, he went across the rope backwards to Canada. And then when he came back to the U.S., he was pushing a wheelbarrow, blindfolded. That is so cool. And the crowd was amazed. Like, ooh, ah. And he's feeding off their energy. He gets excited. And he looks at him and he says, he says, do you believe that I can carry a person back across in this wheelbarrow? And they said, yes, we believe you can do it. And he said, okay, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? Crickets. (laughs) Nothing. Why? They believed but they didn't believe, right? Like they had just seen him. They saw the evidence. They saw that he could walk across the tightrope blindfolded, pushing a wheelbarrow, no problem. But they didn't trust it enough to get in the wheelbarrow. That is the difference. In Scripture, when it talks about believing, it's talking about trust. When Jesus says, how do, you do, how do you do the works of God? Believe in him whom he sent. 
He's saying, put your trust in me. Climb in my wheelbarrow and let me carry you. Let me take care of you. I got this. That is what he's talking about. That's the kind of faith that we're talking about here. It is possible to sit in church year after year after year and hear the word of the Lord taught year after year after year and believe it intellectually, but not own it in your heart to the extent that you really just go all in. You really put your faith in it. Even after you've seen the evidence, you've got to get in the wheelbarrow. When Abraham believed God, that is what he was doing. He was placing his unwavering trust in the Lord. And this is what made God label him as righteous. God's righteousness accounted to Abraham because of Abraham's trust and only because of that. Now, before you jump in and say, well, that's a, that's a work. He chose to trust. Well, not really. Because the scripture also tells us that faith is a spiritual gift. He has to give us that. Now, he can give it to us and we cannot use it. That's where we have a choice to make. But we're not creating anything that brings us closer to the Lord. He is the one extending his hand. He is the one setting the table and issuing the invitation. And we need to hang on to that truth. Verse 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So there's the danger in not totally selling out completely to the idea that it's all about faith and grace. You end up, maybe even subconsciously, maybe you're not even aware of it, but you end up thinking that God owes you something because of the things you have done. If Abraham had been labeled as righteous because he left home or because he was willing to sacrifice Isaac, then his blessings would have been a reward. The paying of a debt owed him by God. And God owes nobody anything. The same would be true if our salvation has been granted or sustained by our works. Wages paid to a faithful servant. Maybe that seems like a small point to you. But I want you to be aware of how your flesh and the enemy can bring a subtle attack against you in this area. Who remembers the song, Butterfly Kisses? You guys are old. Used to love that song. Very sweet, beautiful. Uh, well, I sang it in a wedding one time. Just a, a great thing. Everybody loved this song back then, right? It's about this guy, and he's got this little kid, and, and the little kid, when they were getting ready for bed, they would say their prayers, and, and then they would do butterfly kisses. They'd lean up by his face and, and blink their eyes, and so their eyelashes would, would rub against his cheek, and that was a, he called that a butterfly kiss. Beautiful song. And so there's this, this thing in there where it says, uh, with all the things I've done wrong, I must have done something right because of the prayers in the morning and the butterfly kisses at night. Beautiful, heartfelt felt, wondrous song, horrible theology. It just doesn't work. See, he, he, he was saying that he had done something right and he had earned the blessing of the child and their love and their closeness to him. And that kind of concept can seep into our lives if we're not careful. It's all around us. Facebook Christians are big on this, so be on the lookout for it. If you ever think, man, I prayed a lot today. And I've been swatting away temptations left and right, so I know God's going to give me a great day. You have drifted into the thought that God owes you a great day because you have done something right. And it doesn't seem like a big deal. But if that concept takes root and grows, which is what sin does, it becomes a problem. Now, the opposite side of that coin is just as dangerous. I hear this a lot from people. 
who are going through something hard, something that hurts. They say, why did this bad thing happen? I read, I prayed, I went to church, I, I gave, I served, I, I did all the stuff. Why would God allow this to happen to me? You might want to ask Job about that one. He fleshes it out really well and God explains it really well there. The scriptures are full of examples like that where God allows adversity to test his people or refine us or give us an opportunity to be a solid witness of faith in him to somebody who has none. Sometimes they can only see it through our adversity. If you're doing the daily uh, Bible in a year reading with me, you just saw God explain that to the children of Israel. He told them up front, I didn't wipe out everybody from in front of you because I'm going to use some of those people to test you. He warned them. They still failed. They knew the test was coming. They still failed. I want you to know the test is coming. And I want you to know that you never have to fail. If God allows something difficult to happen in your life, it has a purpose and he has already equipped you for it or else it wouldn't happen. He never sends us things that he won't help us through. And they're all open book tests anyway. So don't fear those things and don't be angry about those things. Don't be confused about those things. He is testing you because it's important that you know where you stand. God is not confused. He knows where your faith is. But sometimes I need some reassurance. If I'm in a, a season of drifting, I need to know that too. And the quickest way for me to see that is if I'm confronted with a difficulty and I don't handle it well. I may not catch it in the moment. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. But maybe the next day when I'm thinking about it and how I reacted, what I said, my attitude or whatever, I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's an opportunity to make a course correction. It's a good thing. The Bible says that rain falls on the just and the unjust. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So it's okay. You're in my wheelbarrow. You can be fine. I've got this. I've got you. Look at verse 5 again. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. To him who believes on who? On him. Jesus. Everybody has faith in something. Everybody thinks that they are following the path that will get them to where they want to go. It could be a religion. It could be self-reliance. It could be on any number of things. But they have a faith in that. They have a belief that that is the right way. So it's not just faith that saves. It's faith on Him that saves. Faith in the truth. It's not faith in faith, which I see in people sometimes, honestly. It can't be faith in religion, even if you are doing religion really, really well. Your faith can't be in that. It certainly can't be in your own goodness. The grand scale of, of doing more good than, than bad, trying to make it way out in your favor. Your faith can't be in that. This is one of the heartbreaking things about some of the cults that are out there that, that profess Jesus. They teach works, righteousness. They, they teach that you have to do enough good to literally make it to him when it's all said and done. And the people caught in those cults are, are miserable because they aren't sure. They don't really know how it's going to turn out. You ask them, they will say they hope to be with God when it's all said and done. But they mean hope the way we mean hope most of the time. They desire for it to be so. In the Greek, that's not what the word means. In the Greek used in the New Testament, that word hope actually speaks of assuredness of an outcome, confidence in an outcome. 
I am absolutely 100% totally in full belief that it will work out this way. That is the hope that Jesus brings. Not a, oh man, I really hope so. Totally different thing. Peter, filled with the Spirit, put it this way before the religious leaders he addressed in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 11. This is the stone, he's talking about Jesus. This is the stone which was rejected by your builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. One way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. None come to the Father except through me. Faith, but faith in the right thing. Faith in Jesus. Paul has moved on from Abraham's example, and now he introduces David's, another giant character in the history of all that we have. Why does he take the time to, to add testimony from another guy? He's speaking to the Jewish people. In their law was the concept of, uh, in, in the legal system, you have to have two witnesses to prove anything. One doesn't cut it. You have to have two people have seen the same thing, give the same testimony to believe anything in court. So Paul calls two witnesses, Abraham and David. The quote from David, which affirms the idea that it's not about works, but about faith. Look at verse 7 and 8 again. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall, impute, shall not impute sin. Not blessed, as though, blessed are those who do all the right things. Not blessed are those who have made up for their past wrongs. But blessed are those whose lawless deeds are no longer attributed to their account. It's not on their tally sheet anymore because of their belief, their trust in the Lord. When God said that, that Abraham's uh, belief was accounted to him as righteousness, that word accounted in, in, the, in the Greek, it means make a decision, something has been decided on. But that's a term that was used in legal and financial matters to, to describe when the things in my account got accredited to your account. It's a one-sided transaction where my stuff becomes your stuff. And that is what happened with Abraham. And that is what happens with us. We come to the Lord Jesus and give our life to Him, accept that He is who He says He is, that He can do what He says He can do. And then His righteousness gets put on our account sheet. And it replaces everything that we ever were before. It's not we're bad but Jesus. It's, man, it's like we were never bad. It's like we never did anything wrong. It's like we've always been as perfect as He is. It's amazing. I hope you see how amazing that is. So it's all about faith. What about works then? Does that mean we just don't have to do any works? We can just sit around and enjoy church, hang out, have cookouts, potlucks, casseroles? <laughs> Amen? All right. Where do works, charity, witnessing, evangelizing, serving, giving, where, where do they fit in? The people of God who have fully placed their trust in Him alone, His righteousness and grace and mercy, as the means by which they are saved, will find it easy to trust in the idea of His Lordship over their life as well. And He will lead them to do things that are a blessing to others. That's just how it works. If He can be trusted to save from hell, He can certainly be trusted to lead in every way. So these people, people of faith, all of us, I hope, will find themselves praying and studying and worshiping and witnessing and serving, loving God, loving everybody else, not because they're trying to earn God's blessing, but because they're responding in an appropriate way to the blessings they have already received, freely given, because they are freely received. That's how it's supposed to work. 
We who believe will work. Why? Because we have taken the yoke of Jesus upon ourselves, as he has encouraged us to do. But we will understand that what keeps us tied to him is our trust of him, our faith. Faith is the yoke. It's the thing that attaches us to the Lord and keeps us attached. And when we're attached, we will go where he goes and do what he does, pulling whatever plow he has hitched to himself in whatever field he wants plowed. So there will be work. But there will be rest, too. We'll talk about that later, too. Verse 9. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. There's the proof that the gift of grace is definitely not tied to being from the nation of Israel or being part of a religion or being part of a specific bloodline. Because even though the Israelites are his chosen people, the blessedness, and in the Greek that means the good fortune, the, the happiness, that was given before the institution of the religious rituals and the ceremonies that set them apart as his. The promises of God are based on the concept of adoption by him, not achievement by us. So we have access to the imputed righteousness too. Imputed is the same word as accounted in the Greek. So when he imputes righteousness to us, he has taken his and put it on our tally sheet. It's beautiful. It's wondrous. It's awesome. Verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. You know, we talked last week about the purpose of the law. People get that twisted in their brain. They think the law, the rules are the chores that you do to earn something from God. It's not that at all. The purpose of the law is to show you that you can't follow the rules. That there's no way for you to be worthy. To prove to you that you need a savior. That is its purpose. If God had never written down laws, there wouldn't be any sin. But he did. So there is. But that's okay, because he also provided a Savior for when we don't match up with the rules. Again, beautiful system. 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who were of the law, but also to those who were of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believed God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. There, guys, is the real blessing of the system God has chosen to use as a way of allowing us to be brought into a right relationship with him. That the promise might be sure. God always has a reason for what he does. 
It's not just that he, he knew we wouldn't make it on our own. It's not just that he knew we would need help to get there. He also wanted us to be able to rest when we did get there. He wanted us to, to be sure that our salvation is real and that our hope is, is definite and never has to be worried about. That the promise might be sure. The mechanism is faith and not works so that the promise can be sure. It's not a list of chores that we might not completely fulfill even though we try. You ever played shoots and ladders with your kids? Man, that's a frustrating game. You can have a perfect game. Man, you can be beating your five-year-old grandchild. They don't have a chance of winning. And then you get right to the end. Man, I hate that game. That's what it's like if you try to earn God's grace, if you try to earn salvation, if you try to earn his blessings. You could be doing it great. Man, you have a great devotional today and tomorrow, and you, you helped that young couple, and, and you had a great quiet time, and you went to church, and you got prayed over, and hallelujah, everything was wonderful. And then, man, do something foolish on Friday. Boom. Our Father is so gracious and kind and loving and merciful that He did not want us caught up in that kind of game. He doesn't want there to be frustration. He doesn't want there to be worry or anxiety or fear. He wants the promise to be sure. And He wants us to understand that it is sure. And because it all rests on His perfect works, we can be assured of peace, comfort, and even rest. What is rest? It's the opposite of work. No coincidence there that Jesus uses the term rest when He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That whole passage. He ends it with, you will find rest for your souls. Yoke yourself to me. There's going to be plenty of work to do. But that's where you're going to find rest. The opposite of work because it's not about work. It's about hope. Not only the desire for something to turn out a certain way, but expectation. Confidence that it will. Because we are, as verse 21 puts it, fully convinced that what he has promised, he is able to perform. See, that is the thing. The people watching the guy with the wheelbarrow and the blindfold, they were positive that he could do it again until their life depended on it. And then they weren't. And I hope and pray that you are not approaching the Lord like that. I hope you don't come here on Sunday and hear the message from the Word and you get all pumped up and you actually believe He can do everything He says He can do. And then by Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, I mean, you're not so sure anymore. God has more than that for you. That is not what He wants for you. He wants you to be sure, positive, confident that he can do what he says he can do. How many promises has God ever made that he didn't follow through on? None, not a single one, ever. And he never will. It says here that Abraham believed that, that, that when God spoke, that, that even when he spoke things that hadn't happened, he believed that they were going to happen. A lot of times that's how prophecy is, is given in Scripture. It's given as a past tense word. We saw this when we studied Revelation a few years ago. We've got all these prophetic words about the end times and how that's all going to go. And we're not there yet, clearly. But when you read the prophecies, it speaks of it in present and future tense. As though it's already happened. Why is that? Because when God says something, it's as good as done. You don't have to wonder if it's going to happen. So when he says, to bring it to the gospel, when he says, if you believe in your heart, 
profess with your mouth that he was raised from the dead and he has ascended back to the Father, you will be saved. You can be sure. You can have biblical hope on that. Verse 22. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. If you know nothing else about anything when it comes to theology, please know this. God's righteousness, the only thing that can save us, the only thing that can cover our sin, making it possible for us to spend eternity with him, will be imputed to us, put on our tally sheet and our account if we believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. You have waited patiently for an Easter message today. There it is. It's in those last two verses. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Today, we celebrate the empty tomb. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because it was in the taking back up of his life. And ultimately in his reascension to sit at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That we see all the proof we need to know that he is who he says he is. And can do what he says he can do. And if you can believe that, you can believe anything he tells you. And there is amazing peace and comfort and strength that comes from that, no matter what is going on around you. And that's what I want for you. Because that's what he wants for you. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Talking to Jesus. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Just as sure as Jonah lived after being in the belly three days, Jesus lives now. It is absolute. And that proves that our salvation is secure. It proves that our atonement has been made and that his righteousness has been credited to the account of all who believe in him. Believe. Put their trust in him. So there's the question. Do you believe? Not like the crowd at Niagara Falls. But are you ready to get in the wheelbarrow? Are you already in the wheelbarrow? The eyewitness testimony, not only from Scripture, but also of secular history books of the time, proves that there was a man named Jesus. He was from Nazareth. He well, was crucified on a Roman cross. He died and was buried. And then, three days later, people started saying he was alive again, that the tomb was empty. And then for another 40 days after that, there were over 500 people who claimed to have seen him somewhere, walking around, having a meal with people, talking to people, teaching, all the way up until the apostles said they saw him ascend into the clouds and back to heaven. Now, maybe it doesn't strike you as amazing that 500 people said they saw Jesus walking around. Here's the thing about that. He didn't have 500 followers then. There were a little over 100 in the upper room after he was laid to rest, not knowing what was coming next. So there were people that didn't believe he was who he said he was who saw him. That's good eyewitness testimony to count on. And what about the apostles? 
Can we really trust their testimony? I think we can. Because they were all willing to die for it. All any one of them had to do was refute the story. And they would have lived to a nice old age. But they couldn't. Because they knew the truth. Because they saw it. You see Jesus ascending in the clouds to heaven. You're never going to turn from him. Wherever it is that you see Jesus in your life, let that give you the same kind of confidence, the steadfastness, the, the lack of ability to turn away. Maybe you're in this room and you have not given your life to the Lord yet, or maybe after hearing the definition of the word believe, you thought you had and you haven't. Here's what I want you to know. All the facts of the story, that he existed, that he died, that he was buried, that people said they saw him after that, that people said they saw him ascending, those facts are settled. You don't get to decide whether those things are true or not. All you get to do is decide what to do with it. You have to decide how to interpret those facts. Do you believe Jesus accomplished the atonement for the sins of the world by his work at Calvary? By his death, his burial, his resurrection. Do you believe that he said that if you put your trust in that, you will be saved? Is your trust in Christ alone or in yourself a little bit too? Yeah, what Jesus did. And if I just do this, no, 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 no. Don't make the mistake of thinking you have anything to offer, but also... Please don't make the mistake of thinking he requires you to have anything to offer. He did it all. Think of the last week of his life. The horrible things that he went through. All the time in the Garden of Gethsemane when it says he was sweating drops of blood. He was so overwrought with emotional distress. We know that was a, a time of temptation from the enemy. We don't know what was actually said, but there's this, this book that Spurgeon wrote, and he talks about that. And he said, look, I don't know what the, what the devil said that night either, but I know what he says to me when I'm trying to walk in God's will. I know what he says to me to try to tempt me to give up and to stop. And it's things like, you'll never make it. You're not strong enough. You can't do it. God won't help you. You're on your own. He left you out here to fail. Or he will say, he'll go the other direction. He'll say, okay, you're going you're gonna to do it, but it's not going to matter. It's not going to make a difference. They're going to turn on you. They're not going to love you for it. They're going to hate you for it. For the very salvation you offer, they're going to hate you. So that's why Jesus was so oppressed in the garden that night. But what did he do? He prayed. He accepted in his human flesh that there was weakness there, that, that the words of the enemy were having an impact. And so he went somewhere where he could get alone in the quiet and pray and talk to God. And God answered that prayer. He sent an angel to minister to him. And there was a point there where, where the prayer was answered to the extent that his, his hope, I, the fullness of, of his strength was restored. And he stood up. And he locked his eyes on Calvary and he just went forward. The physical part of the temptation was still to come. The emotional part was dealt with in the garden. The physical part was awful. He was beaten and mocked and, and, and spit on and they yanked hair out of his beard and the crown of thorns and the scourging and everything was so awful. But his, he had been so renewed by the prayer and the, the victory over the emotional distress and the temptations of that, 
that he stuck to the promise and didn't even open his mouth to defend himself. He just went through it. Why? Because it was settled in his heart and in his mind that he was in the will of the Father, that he was doing what had to be done for you to be saved, for me to be saved. And nothing was going to stop him from that. Not even death. So the question today is, will you put all of your faith in that man, in that God? Salvation is by grace through faith in him alone, and it's yours for the taking. He is yours, and you are his. By grace through faith. If that's not you yet today, I hope today is your day of salvation. Please don't leave here confused. If you want to talk to somebody about that, if you want to answer, ask questions, I'll stay here as long as you want. I'll have that conversation all day. Because I don't want you to leave here confused. I don't want you to leave here in danger. He loves you. Love him back worth it. Amen. Amen. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of everything that we've looked at this week, the Passion Week. We've, we've watched you. We've retraced those steps over and over and over again this week, and we are drawn to your magnificence and your glory. The fact that there was nothing you were not willing to do to go through so that we could be saved. It's just hard to even believe. And yet you did it because of the great love with which you loved us. Not because we were worthy of it. Not because we had earned it at all. We never could. We never can. We never will. But just because you are a great God, we can be assured of salvation. And we praise you for that in this place today. Be glorified in our hearts, Lord. Use us to share the truth this week with people that we run into. That they would be drawn to you as well. Fill your people with hearts of praise and an understanding of you and what you have done. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. amen. Love you all.